Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHope2018.com. I want to talk about the the latter rain, the former and the latter rain uh, in Scripture. But what I want to do is back up a few verses that and that leads into that. Now, uh, so what you're going to see in this video is is a little bit of of New Testament. Uh, comfort for the believer as well as what I believe is significant prophetically so if you'll kind of just bear with me um, now I want to repeat again uh, the fact that and I'm sure people get tired of hearing this but it's so important this is God's Word not man's word uh, James wrote Matthew Luke Mark wrote, uh, Paul wrote, Moses wrote, but they were all writing under the direction and inspiration of God Almighty. There's only one author, and you and I have the privilege, the immense privilege of being able to study the word of the sovereign God. Everything God wants us to know, he's told us. He says that he's given us all truth that's in this book and we are the ones who were told to study to show ourselves approved workmen that need not to be ashamed. The Almighty God in his infinite wisdom chose to use man in his work. He didn't, he didn't need to do that. He didn't need human authors. He could have had angels write this, folks. He could have he could have spoken it into printed press without an author or or anything else, but he didn't. And then clearly it is apparent to all of us that God in his wisdom, his decrees and plans uses man to accomplish his purposes. Now we have the privilege, the marvelous privilege to study together the word of the sovereign God. I am not interested at all in the least in the thoughts of Paul, the mind of Paul or James or, or Joel or Isaiah or any human author. I think it's so easy to think along those lines. We'll talk about what James thought, you know, what Paul thought, and then without realizing it, we install this insidious idea in the minds of people the possibility that this isn't God's Word. Once we've taken that route, we'll take it any way we want. It's no longer God's Word. This is God's Word. It needs to be handled carefully, diligently. It is the Word of the Almighty God. Oh, how we are so much more often occupied in other pursuits that we have little time for this book. Yes, God gave the word, but that doesn't mean he gave the meaning of this word infinitely into every human head. We are commanded to study to show ourselves approved workmen that need not be ashamed. You know, I used to watch a lot of YouTube videos. Many of my followers know this. I watched them for years. When I began this ministry several years ago, I basically stopped watching YouTube. And the reason I did that was because I felt compelled to draw my own conclu conclusions from my own studies and not allow all of that influence to impress be, you know, influence my thinking as it regards my as it regarded my conclusions now that may make sense to some of you and to some of you it may not i understand the idea that well steve you're no island to yourself and and all of that but in my defense what i will say is and i'll repeat this is that i did not want and this this is what i i see so many people doing the, the reason why there's a lot, so much error permeates the body of Christ is because people will, will watch something 
and they'll they'll say oh that sounds great and then they'll parrot that information never having really studied the subject themselves I determined I was not going to do that and I think it's for the best that I did so whatever conclusions that I read these are my conclusions you can agree or disagree you don't have to agree with me at all in fact I I encourage you not to I've, I've insisted over and over and over again that people do the, their own research and, and draw their own conclusions don't believe something just because I do now I want to look at James 5 6 in James 5 6 we read you have condemned and killed the just and he does not withstand or resist you that's where I want to start now there's several approaches to that verse one is that this is speaking of the rich man uh, if you remember the first five six verses of chapter five are addressed to the rich to those whose great interest is in acquiring money success power respect etc etc and it doesn't matter who they stomp on to get there the primary receivers of the first six verses of chapter 5 are those who are not Christian I'm not suggesting that there that there may be some of God's elect there that don't know it yet I don't know that but the first six verses are addressed to those who are not concerned about the things of Christ they have condemned and murdered the just the righteous one there are those who feel that that's what they do it doesn't matter who they trample on it doesn't matter what they do to these righteous ones they actually murder them the other position and the one that I believe is the correct one is that this is a reference to Christ you have murdered and killed the just one and he does not resist you it's interesting that this expression the just one is used of Christ for example in Acts we we know we learn that you denied the Holy One and desired a murderer to be granted unto you the just the righteous one the Holy One same individual which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one same words that we have here and that of course we know is the Lord Jesus Christ these people cried out they cried for a convicted murderer to be released and an innocent Savior to be condemned the Lord Jesus Christ did not stand against them he did not resist them as a sheep before his shears so he opened not his mouth my brethren this is your Lord God Almighty dared to leave heaven's glory and become human to be a man made in the likeness of sinful flesh though without sin that he might be your kinsman redeemer that he might die in your place to pay your sin debt now, if you don't believe that your sins have been forgiven you don't believe God if you don't believe that you have been perfected forever you don't believe God allow me to speak bluntly you must think that he lied because he said he ha he says he has you are new creations in Christ Jesus he who knew no sin the impeccable Christ not only did he not sin he could not and and he who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him that is your Redeemer he did not resist them he didn't open his mouth they falsely condemned him they hurled insults against him and he was meekly led to the cross and he died in your place think of it just think of it dearly beloved God who created those very creatures who crucified him he could have annihilated them with a wink of his eye or a word from his mouth but he didn't because he loved you 
Can you fathom such love that he would deign to leave the glories of heaven and die in your place? I believe the sixth verse is a beautiful text from God Almighty on how people who are satisfied with their riches treat Christ. And no, it's not universally true. But remember the words of our Lord. When the rich young ruler came and departed from him, our Lord said how hard it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. He doesn't need Christ. He doesn't need forgiveness. He doesn't even think about it. He has money. He has success. He has power. How hard it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. You who are rich in this world can be happy that if you truly love the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be happy that there's the word many in that verse. Not many righteous, not many noble. Not, he didn't say n no righteous, uh, no, not, none at all. He didn't say that. He said not many. Not many powerful are called. You can, you can know that and you can be thrilled. This speaks of ones principally who were opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know who you are. The Pharisees, the lawyers, the leaders in Israel are the ones who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And he was crucified because he loved you and he loved me. So they murdered the just one. And he wasn't withstanding them. He didn't fight against them because he came to die for the very people that condemned him. The Roman government. A Roman governor declared that he considered Christ to be just. He called him the just one. Imagine a Roman ruler called our Lord just and yet delivered him to be crucified. Remember his boastful words when he said to Christ, don't you realize I have the power to crucify you and I have the power to set you free? If he considered him just, how could he not set him free? Why did he not set him free? He didn't set him free because he did not have the power to do so. He didn't have the power to set him free. Jesus Christ did not leave heaven's glory to be set free. He left the glory of heaven and the adulation of the angels to die in your place and in mine. And nothing, nothing Pilate could have done in any way could have denied the cross from the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to die for you and for me. And though Pilate made that foolish boast in his power, he did not have the power to set this just one free. Yet he was the just one, and Pilate murdered him. Did the Lord point out that he was innocent? Did the Lord resist the government? No, he did not. He didn't open his mouth because he came to die. It isn't that he, was, he wasn't innocent. He was innocent. He was without spot. He was the lamb that was without spot, and he was killed for you and for me. By his one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those whom he has set apart. What a wonderful thought. If you don't believe that you're perfected forever, if you don't believe your sins are forgiven. As I've mentioned so many times in so many videos, you are calling God a liar. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You do stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. And so now we are instructed to be patient. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Quite fitting for the times that we're now living. Therefore, brethren. The therefore means what? What is the therefore, therefore? Because they condemned and murdered the just one. He didn't resist them. Therefore, therefore. We are exhorted to patience, and this in the context of his coming for us. So now, let's think about that for a moment. The word patience here is mac macrothumia in the Greek. 
there are uh, two words that are translated patience in the scriptures. This is macrothumia, macrothumia, macrothumia. It means patience with respect to people who work against you, people who, who are causing problems in your life. In this illustration given to us in the seventh verse, look at it. Be patient, therefore, brethren. Brethren. Yes, James is calling us a brother. But more importantly, God, the Holy Spirit, has called you brethren. Yeah, you can say James calls you a brother, but it's not only James calling you a brother, it's God Almighty. Be patient, therefore, brethren. Jesus was patient. He stood before them patiently. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't resist them. You also, you know, have those who may be problems in your life. Be patient, steadfast, therefore, brother, until the coming of the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit uses an interesting illustration of a farmer. The farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. And I believe we can suggest, rightly suggest, I think it's safe to, to suggest that the fruit mentioned here are also people. There is a literal application as well as a spiritual. That God patiently waits for those who are his. What can the farmer do? Well, he can, he can sow the seed. He can cultivate he can fertilize but we don't control the frost we we can't control the temperature we can't control the rain the farmer patiently waits god is the one who gives the increase and just as a farmer patiently waits for it realizing that we can't do anything about it so we patiently endure in the presence of those who criticize, fight, take advantage of us, or whatever, knowing that the coming of the Lord is nigh. Do we really understand what it means to trust Him? I've, I have said I don't know how many times in my life I've told people face to face, I've said if, if what I believe that Jesus Christ desires more from us than anything, is that we trust him. Do we really understand what it means to trust him? To trust in the Lord with all our heart. I've had people over the years, I know I've mentioned this before, who have come to me who seem desperately concerned to know the will of God. Does he want Does he want me in this city that, or that city? Does he want me to take this job or that job? Or go to this college or that college? Or marry this person or that person? goes on and on and on and I can't help but think do they really want to know and do the will of God and they always they always answer well absolutely God God wants me in Oklahoma City you know uh, I'll go live in Oklahoma City I want to do what he wants done well fine I'll tell you that he doesn't want you to worry about anything do not worry about anything be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts, shall guard your, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The only way that you can possibly know the peace of God that passes understanding is to trust Him. The almighty, eternal God is working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. You know the will of God. Read it. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Study to show yourselves approved. A workman that needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't worry about anything. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. I know that he's working in you according to his good pleasure, that he's working all things together, all things, all things together. I, you know, I want to say that a thousand times. All things together for your good. 
that he will never leave you nor forsake you. What more do you want? What more do you want? I used to always like my older brother with me. He was he was so strong and so big that nobody ever messed with me. You know, every once in a while there'd be somebody that wanted to get tough, and when they saw my brother, they always walked away. But he's nothing compared to my God. What can touch me that doesn't go through his hand? Look how God dealt with Job. We all we're all familiar with Job. Was that fair to Job? Why would God kill his children and ruin his business? You say, well, God didn't. Satan did it. But Satan could not have done it unless God permitted it. Job's trust was not in Satan. Job's prayers and worship were not to Satan. They were to God, which is precisely why God allowed Satan to do what he did to test Job. And if the God, the God if the God that, that he worships did not have the power to stop Satan, then he's not really much of a God. Even Satan himself admitted that God had built a wall around Job, and had not God opened a window in that wall, Satan was powerless, just as Pilate was powerless in trying to deliver the Lord Jesus Christ. My God is working everything together for my good. If you don't believe that, then you have to say God lied. You have to say God lied. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, and that includes cancer, a heart attack, loss of work, loss of a job, nor things to come are able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you don't believe it, if you do not believe it, you can't possibly know the peace that passes understanding. Being therefore justified by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. I can't, I can't imagine anything better. God isn't fighting with me, so why should I fight with him? He knows the way that I take. He's working in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. He is with you as well as he is with me. Do you believe that? If you really believe that, then there's no reason to worry about anything. There's no reason but to trust him. Every single Christian alive is familiar with the lilies of the field. Look, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. How does one grow? Does it, does it roam around looking for a fertile place in the soil? Well, of course not. It has no power over where it is. It has no control over what it's fed. It has no control over what it drinks. It has no power whether the sun comes up or it doesn't. What, what does the lily do? It just, it just grows. It grows because God provides. And if he does that, and this is what we all have read and from have since vacation Bible school, if he does that for the lilies of the field, how much more do you think God cares for you? I bet there's not a Christian listening to my voice right now who hasn't read that passage in the Bible. But do we really live like it, is what I would ask. I think of this concept of patience in this particular case is is patience with respect to those things that are brought into my life by the business world, the rich people, people who are opposed to Jesus Christ, people who are there to sow doubt. He's either working all things together for your good or he's not. It's just that simple. And my God, my God does not lie. He doesn't lie. He cannot lie. So we're to be patient until the coming of the Lord. The farmer isn't just sitting around waiting for something that he planted to grow. He's out working the field. He, he looks forward to the crops, just as we should look forward to the fact that, that we, the wheat, the children of God, will be taken into his kingdom. I'm astounded at the number of Christians that I run into who don't seem to have any concept 
whatsoever of the coming of the Lord. I know that I will give an accounting for this ministry, for, for my life, for every word that I've spoken. This is why I take it so seriously. I know that, that you will as well, and I know that that accounting is not for the sin in my life, but for how I built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That's what the scriptures say. My sins are forgiven. It won't even come into the picture. If I stand before God and am called into account for my sin, then God lied. God says there is therefore now no condemnation to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We're not going to live our lives down here below with there being therefore now no condemnation, only get only to arrive in heaven before the judgment seat of Christ, and all of a sudden now there's condemnation. No, there is no judgment. If there is no judgment, I cannot be judged for my sin. If I am, they're not forgiven. If they're not forgiven, then my God lied. But he tells you he has forgiven all your sin. He tells you he has forgiven all your trespasses. He tells you that your sin was placed on Christ. Your accounting will be how you handled your life based upon that fact. How you handled the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. How you built on Christ as the foundation. No other foundation but Christ. That day will soon come and, and we look forward to heaven where that the only accounting we will give is in regard to our service, not our sin. We are persuaded that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. What, what do we have here that could compare, possibly compare with heaven? If you are not perfected forever and ready for glory to stand before him without spot, then he lied. It isn't you, it's him. He's the one that loses everything. He has perfected forever those whom he has set apart. But let's don't confuse patience with eagerness. It's okay to, to be eager and excited about his soon coming. I can't imagine anyone that would rather stay here than go to glory to be with our Lord. Do you love him? We're told in scripture that we love him because he first loved us. And I want to refresh your memory again as to how much he loved you. He who enjoyed the glory of heaven, the adulation of the angels, that constant praise of those who were in heaven, left its glory to be made human flesh. Your kinsman, made in the likeness of, of sinful flesh, the impeccable Christ became a human. He did not sin. He was he was not made a sinner. He was made sin to be sin, and he was justified in the Spirit. That's my God. Why shouldn't I love him if he loved me so much? He came, he came down to what would be a, a pigsty compared to heaven, or, well, or even worse. I can't even think of the word for that. And then without complaint, without resistance, he died in my place because... That's what he came to do. The fact that he rose from the dead is the testimony of the almighty eternal God that the price paid for my sin was sufficient. Therefore, by the blood of his cross, I am presented before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. No wonder we have a joy that's unspeakable. No wonder we have a peace that passes understanding. No wonder we have a hope that shores up in times of difficulty. We are to be steadfast, patient, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is near. It is, it's near in the sense that you're not going to live very long anyway. But it's also near in the sense that we are being shown that he is at the door. And especially so for the past year and a half. 
or, or longer even. We're closer to glory now than we were when we first believed. The coming of the Lord is nearer now than it was last September. It's nearer now than it was yesterday. So how close are we really? This is uh, this last part of this video here is more for you for you people who are just really more interested in the prophetic stuff than the theological stuff. So how close are we really? Let's let's read on. Be patient, therefore, brethren, and to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. So I want to talk about the former and latter rains. I believe this obviously has two meanings, literal and prophetic. If you look at Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it reads, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Now, first of all, is the phrase, in the third day he will raise us up, is that, is that referring to Jesus or Israel? Well, the answer is both. Both. After two days, Jesus arose on the third day. No other nation or people in all of history was ever revived after being smitten as was the nation Israel. Their very rebirth as a nation is itself a witness and a confirmation of our Lord Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. And he shall come unto us as the rain unto the earth, as the latter and former rain, or as the word should be rendered, the harvest rain and the rain of seed time. Deuteronomy 11, uh, Proverbs 16. The Hebrew words here that are used have nothing of latter or former implied in their meaning. What the translation here terms the latter rain, the Hebrew word for that is literally the crop rain which fell just before the season of the harvest to plump the grain before it was severed. It fell in the spring, the former part of the year. The harvest in Judea began about the middle of March the other word, which we, we term the former rain, and which is literally the, uh, the springing rain, or the rain which makes to spring, it fell upon the seed newly sown, causing the green blade to shoot up out of the ground. That is, it fell about the end or middle of October, which we consider as the latter end of the year. The former or the autumn rain fell in October at the seed time, the latter or the spring rain in March and April. We read from Jeremiah chapter 5, they do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Jesus, I know, was born, he came, arrived on earth in September. There's, there's early rain. He, he may return, rapture and second ad, advent both, in the spring, latter rain. Spring rapture equals the spring second coming. This is what I, I wish people would understand. A spring rapture would, would, would require a spring second coming whereas an autumn or a fall rapture would require a fall second coming because there's 200 uh, 2000 excuse me 2550 days 2550 days between the two there is a required 2550 days in between the rapture and the return of Christ 
at the second coming on any timeline, any year. It's always been that way. I mean, that's just the math, folks. Okay. To put it quite simply, if Jesus, if the rapture occurs in January, the second coming is going to occur in, in January. If, if, the, if the rapture uh, occurred in July, the second coming would occur in July. It just, that's how the 2550 days works. Now, the former rain, the autumn rain, which is, which is needful to mellow the earth and, and fit it to receive what is sown. Fall, autumn. The month Jesus was born or came was September. I find that interesting. I believe it started when he came. The latter rain, which is needful to bring forward and ripen what was sown before harvest, is spring. So the former or early rain occurred in autumn. The latter or the late rain occurred in spring. Crops were planted in October or November and they, they were harvested sometime after March and April, which is spring. The coming of the Holy Spirit in the person of Christ has been partially fulfilled, but its complete fulfillment will occur at Jesus' second coming and in the kingdom. Latter rain, spring. But what I want you to note is that any timeline of 2550 days that begins in the spring must end in the spring. Just as any timeline that begins in the fall has to end in the fall. Joel chapter 2 actually describes the coming of the Holy Spirit at Jesus' second coming. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness and do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and, he, and ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed, this is my conclusion, and I don't ask anybody to agree with me on anything, this included, but my conclusion based on these passages and others, some spring, we're looking at the Lord's return. Look, I love you all, I truly do. I really do appreciate all your, your love and your words of encouragement and support. Thanks for listening.